In this video, I will give you 10 scientific reasons to support the airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. This is based on an article that was published on April 15th in The Lancet. Hello everyone and welcome. We are now over one year into the COVID-19 pandemic and the World Health Organization has finally made it official that SARS-CoV-2 is airborne. And this has many, many implications for the management of the COVID-19 pandemic. The information that I'm going to share with you today is based on an article that was published in The Lancet on April 15th, just a few weeks before the World Health Organization made this declaration. This article was published by some extremely renowned and credible scientists, and it certainly does make a very strong argument for airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Let's take a look at the evidence that we have. Let's start with reason number one, super spreading events. Super spreading events account for substantial transmission of SARS-CoV-2. The article states that super spreading events may be one of the primary drivers of the pandemic. We saw this early on with the SARS-CoV-2 transmission in cruise ships, and we saw cruise ships all over the world where this had happened. We have also seen this in correctional facilities, meat packing plants, long-term care homes. All of these events support airborne transmission. Reason number two, long-range transmission of SARS-CoV-2 between people who were adjacent to each other but never in the same room. The prime example for this was in quarantine hotels. I think specifically about Australia where this happened. And it was proven that one person in one of the rooms definitely spread it to another person, yet they did not have any type of contact or any type of interaction even. And so this does support airborne transmission. Reason number three, involves asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission between people who are not coughing or sneezing. Early on in the pandemic, it was well accepted that the virus would spread via droplets, larger droplets that could land on someone or be inhaled when someone coughs or sneezes. But since this time, it has been accepted and there has been much evidence to show that the virus can still spread independent of these large droplets. Asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission accounts for at least one third or up to 59% of transmission. This is a key way that the virus has spread around the world. And this also supports a predominantly airborne mode of transmission. For example, speaking produces thousands of aerosol particles, but only a few droplets. Thus, this supports airborne transmission as well. Reason number four, Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is higher indoors than outdoors and is substantially affected by ventilation. Reason number five involves something called nosocomial infection. Nosocomial infections are infections that occur in people who are being treated for something other than SARS-CoV-2 in a healthcare setting. Nosocomial infections have been documented in healthcare organizations where there have been strict contact and droplet precautions and use of personal protective equipment designed to protect against droplet, but not aerosol exposure. Reason number six, SARS-CoV-2 has been detected in the air. In some laboratory experiments, this virus was able to stay in the air for up to three hours. Viable SARS-CoV-2 was also identified in air samples from rooms occupied by COVID-19 patients in the absence of aerosol generating healthcare procedures and in air samples from an infected person's car. Although some studies have failed to capture SARS-CoV-2 in the air, this is to be expected and it can be explained by the following. Sampling of an airborne virus is technically challenging for several reasons, including limited effectiveness of some sampling methods for collecting fine particles, viral dehydration during collection, viral damage due to impact forces, which leads to the loss of viability of the virus, 
re-aerosolization of the virus during collection, and viral retention in the sampling equipment. It's important to note that measles and tuberculosis have never been cultivated from ambient air. These are both primarily airborne diseases. Reason number seven, identification of the virus in building ducts and different ventilation systems in hospitals where they have COVID-19 positive patients. Reason number eight, animal infection. Now this is one that we saw in a lot of different places early on in the pandemic and we saw animals that were caged where these animals did not have contact with each other yet one by one we started to see contamination and disease happen within these animals. This type of contagion can only be explained by aerosol transmission. Reason number nine is fairly simple. We have a lack of studies that refute airborne transmission yet we have many studies that strongly support it. But this leads to a question. What about people who have shared air with people who are COVID-19 positive, yet they themselves have not contracted the virus? This can be explained due to multiple factors. One of the factors is that some individuals are what we call super spreaders. They shed very, very high amounts of virus and other individuals will shed very, very little amounts of virus. There are other factors like environmental factors, factors that involve ventilation that also affect the ability of someone to transmit this virus to another person. We know also that a minority of primary cases account for the majority of secondary infections. Individuals shedding high levels of virus in indoor crowded settings with poor ventilation has been observed. Then the article goes to talk about the R0 factor or the reproduction factor. The R0 of SARS-CoV-2 is around 2.5, meaning that for every one person with SARS-CoV-2, they will spread the virus to on average about 2.5 people, whereas measles has an R0 of about 15. The widespread variation in respiratory viral load of SARS-CoV-2 counters arguments that SARS-CoV-2 cannot be airborne because the virus has a lower R0 than measles, especially since R0, which is an average, does not account for the fact that only a minority of infectious individuals shed high amounts of virus. Over dispersion of R0 is well documented in COVID-19. And if you've made it this far, last but not least, reason number 10. There is a lack of evidence to support another dominant route of transmission. For example, respiratory droplets or fomite transmission, otherwise known as transmission via surfaces. Some studies have shown that transmission from a surface is actually very, very low and could be maybe only one in every 10,000 infections are transmitted this way. The article goes on to say, the ease of infection between people in close proximity to each other has been cited as proof of respiratory droplet transmission of SARS-CoV-2. However, close proximity transmission in most cases, along with distant infection for a few when sharing air is more likely to be explained by dilution of exhaled aerosols with distance from an infected person. They go on to say, that the flawed assumption that transmission through close proximity implies large respiratory droplets or fomites was historically used for decades to deny the airborne transmission of tuberculosis and measles. The article also explains that sometimes there is the argument that large droplets contain more virus or a higher concentration of virus. And this has since been disproved. It's actually shown that in diseases where concentrations have been quantified by particle size, smaller aerosols showed higher pathogen concentrations than droplets when both of these were measured. So to summarize, the article concludes that there is very strong evidence to support that SARS-CoV-2 is predominantly transmitted via aerosol transmission. The authors also urge the public health community to act without delay with this strong argument 
that SARS-CoV-2 is indeed airborne. For many people, it may have seemed obvious that SARS-CoV-2 was airborne from the beginning, but this paper summarizes these important 10 reasons that are evidence-based for why we need to adopt strategies and public health policies to support the fact that we now understand that SARS-CoV-2 is indeed airborne, and not only that it is airborne, but that transmission is predominantly via the route of airborne transmission. I hope you have found this informative today, and please feel free to share it with others, as I do think that it could be useful, and it could help to impact public health policies in different places in the world. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope that you found this information interesting and helpful. If you're enjoying these videos and finding value in them, I would encourage you to subscribe. Make sure you click on the bell icon to be notified of future videos as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye.